you're given a transfer function, g of s equals 1 over s times s plus 1, how do I decide how to add poles and zeros in any way that I want to? So let's say that I go ahead and look at the root locus for this design. So it's a pretty simple one. I join these two roots together at minus 1 and 0. They meet somewhere in the middle and head off north and south. So this is one of the easiest root locus there is to plot. Uh, but now, you know, I'm maybe not satisfied with this, so I want to add a pole and a zero in order to make the system behave in a different way. So I basically want to move the root locus to the left, because left generally means faster. It means that the oscillations will be exponentially decreasing. Uh, and so how can I do this? Well, I choose a compensator, GC of S, or a controller, and fundamentally what I'm trying to do is move the asymptotes to the left and I may even try to change the angles of the asymptotes based on what it is that I decide to add. So just as a reminder this is what the root locus looks like for the closed loop uh, system here. So this is the the open loop root locus. So as we increase k we're going to be moving the poles together until they split apart. So I'm choosing my controller GC to be, for example, 1 over 3, 1 over S plus 3. So I've just decided I'm going to add another pole here. As I add this other pole, now I'm going to get a different root locus diagram. So using the ideas that we know about root locus plotting, I first mark out the pole zero map, and then I write all the portions of the real axis that are on root locus. But now I'm going to have different values for sigma a and phi a. So the asymptotes and the angles of the asymptotes will now be updated because I've added this extra pole. So sigma a, because I've added the extra pole, is moved just a little bit to the left. So it used to be at uh, minus one half. Now it's at about minus one and one third. So I've noted it here. Most importantly, the angles are different. They used to be plus and minus 90 degrees, but now they're 60, 180, and 300. So, we're still going to head off to our zeros in infinity. But now we're not doing it straight up and down. We're going to be heading back across the j omega axis. So we can calculate the point at which we cross j omega by establishing this function p of s. Uh, and taking its derivative and setting the derivative equal to zero. So the derivative minus 3s squared plus 8s plus 3 equals 0. So s squared plus 8 thirds s plus 1 equals 0 gives us s at minus 0 0.45 and minus 2.21. So only one of these values is actually on the real portion of the root locus. That's this at minus 0 0.45. So that's where we're going to break away. And then we cross j omega, we can find out exactly where by closing the loop on our transfer function. So we take s cubed plus 4s squared plus 3s. That's what happens if we multiply all the bits of the open loop transfer function together. And we go ahead and close the loop with the gain k. So now we're going to get a characteristic equation delta of s equals s cubed plus 4s squared plus 3s plus k. And we're going to use Ruth Hurwitz to find the value of k so that we go unstable. So we're looking for the marginally stable case. So we calculate b1 as 4 times 3 minus k divided by 4. And s0 will just be k. So we're on the j omega axis at k equals 12. Because at that point, this value s1, the b1 term, turns into 0. Which implies that we're marginally stable. So for k equals 12, we can calculate that the roots are 0 plus or minus j 1.73 and minus 4. So if j1 is here, then j 1.73 is about there. So our root locus crosses over here, and that provides us with a fairly accurate sketch of what's going on. So the downside here is that we wanted the system to be faster. I wanted to move everything to the left, but here everything moved to the right by just adding a pole. So instead of just adding a pole,
Now I want to choose a compensator that's just a zero. So now I'm going to choose S plus 3 as my compensator. So again, I get the, root, the real axis pairs of the root locus, and the point running off to minus infinity is actually on the root locus. So even though what I added was a zero, the same segment of the real axis is on root locus because there's an odd number of poles or zeros to the right. Okay, so sigma sub a is at 2. That can't be good. But it's okay because phi a is 180. So we know that we have exactly one asymptote and it heads off to infinity. And we already saw that. So now we can calculate the breakaway point. So again, we're going to multiply s plus 3 over s times s plus 1. Now we're going to invert that and set it equal to 0 after we take its derivative. So dp ds, so we take some derivatives here, set it equal to 0. The minus signs sort of don't matter, and the s plus 3 squared on the bottom sort of doesn't matter. So now we put all these pieces together, and we get that the roots are at minus 0.55 and minus 5.45. So usually when we've been looking at the breakaway points, we've seen that we get a couple of breakaway points that don't make any sense at all because they're not on real axis portions of the root locus or because they're conjugate pairs. So this is an exception because both of these points are on real axis segments of the root locus. So this is the resulting root locus that we get by adding the, just a plain zero at s plus 3. So adding a plane zero will give us this sort of funky looking behavior, which is actually not such a bad behavior because we eventually get rid of all of our oscillation by adding this zero if we turn the gain up to infinity. The downside is that there's no such thing in a physical system as adding a pure zero at s plus three.